welcome on behalf of Interfish Media to our first ever Interfish Digital event. We have a fantastic lineup of, uh, of speakers and a extraordinary time and extraordinary events to discuss. And we're all embracing new ways of communicating, new ways of coming together. And like many of you in the audience, uh, we are all here at Intrafish um, dealing not only with the personal consequences of the uh, coronavirus crisis, but also how to change uh, how we communicate and how we bring people uh, together. So thank you to DNB, our co-organizer. Uh, as you can see, uh, I am coming to you from my home and many of our panelists, all of our panelists, I believe will be doing so as well. And, uh, and we're really looking forward to a fantastic discussion. We have a very brief amount of time, so many topics that we need to get into. Um, so we wanna dive right in. A couple house cleaning notes. Uh, you can over on to your right hand side, uh, ask questions to uh, our moderators. My colleague John Fiorillo is uh, over there monitoring those questions and, uh, and he will be able to uh, collect them. And then at the end, he'll uh, round out a couple of, uh, of questions uh, at the end. So please feel free to ask those along the way. Uh, in pending time, we'll, we'll, um, we'll uh, ask those. So uh, starting off, we are going to have DNB present. Uh, DNB is the world's largest seafood lender, and they're going to be able to offer a good overview of the sector as is, some of the things that are likely to change. Uh, and they're going to focus a bit on the salmon farming sector, uh, salmon being a, a good uh, canary in the coal mine for us for, for what's happening in seafood. So. I'm going ahead and turn it over to Alexander Ochner. He's an equity analyst with DNB Markets. Alexander, uh, you should be ready with your presentation and the floor is yours. Okay. Um, well, we released a, um, a sector report not too, uh, not too long ago um, called Seafood, a relative safe haven. Uh, I think, uh, I think the um, uh, salmon sector represents fairly well uh, the rest of the sector as well. One of the one of the strengths that we're seeing is obviously the, the balance sheet strength. Uh, we have more than 50, 55% equity ratio and less than one times EBITDA in net interest bearing debt by the end of the year. Um, we have cut our, our average 2020 EPS estimates by, excuse me, And um, I was just told I was, I was muted, but uh, I guess you can hear me now. So uh, I do believe that even in a scenario with, with break-even prices over the next 12 months, uh, we believe seafood stocks should be able to go through. Uh, we do expect a V-shaped demand recovery for food, uh, despite a potentially U-shaped recovery for the economy as a whole. And in terms of share price and drop, um, I think even the most bearish scenario in our view uh, has already been, been discounted and uh, we've upgraded all our names to, to buy. In terms of what's happening, I mean, I speak to most of the companies and we'll hear obviously more from, uh, from uh, CEOs of several of these names uh, later on today, but uh, having talked to most of them over the past few weeks, I sort of tried to gather in, in one slide the feedback I've gotten. Uh, so most questions go on the logistics and I think overall um, there's no major disruption to the food logistical uh, flow, at least not into the EU. We're also seeing logistics to Asia starting to normalize. Uh, obviously, there's increased air cargo cost, um, reduced capacity from the European Union to the US, uh, and some logistical challenges in Chile, in Chile and Ireland in particular. But overall, I think the, um, the logistical problems uh, are limited. In terms of the products and the demand side, uh, I mean, obviously we're switching from the hotels and restaurants over to retail. Um, and the question becomes, how much can we actually shift over to retail uh, and at what price? We're seeing companies running more shifts with fewer people in their consumer products units. Uh, we're seeing extra days being added. So working six days rather than five days a week. 
Uh, we're seeing companies running fewer product lines, but longer series. Uh, and we're obviously seeing uncertain buyers. Uh, who will buy? When will they buy? What will they buy? And how much will be demanded? And I think we're pretty close to the, to the eye of the storm at the moment. Um, and obviously, uh, the next few weeks, we're probably going to see significant uh, spot volatility. We're currently seeing salmon prices at uh, sort of the low 50s, which I still think is okay. But I, I do expect them to come down in the short term. In terms of the farming operations, uh, I think they're largely unaffected. Um, <clears throat> most, most farmers are trying to keep their original harvest plants. Uh, and most farmers I've talked to uh, would like to avoid building high inventory of frozen goods. They would rather take a significant hit in the short term uh, and sort of hit the other side of this <clears throat> with a normal market balance. <clears throat> so obviously the spot price, uh, we're seeing significant declines to, uh, to the spot price at the moment. I mean, uh, if you look at the chart on the right hand side here, um, uh, we're seeing euro per kilo prices dropping from, from eight to, to uh, around four. Um, but uh, I, I still think it's, uh, it's, a, it's something we have to expect. Um, Looking at demand lessons, I mean, if you look at the total Norwegian export volumes um, by week in 2020, um, I find it quite interesting to see that obviously we have this massive surge, 24% uh, volume increase in week 11, uh, which I, I believe is probably related to sort of a hoarding effect. Uh, if you just look at exports to the European Union, there were 34% in week 11, and obviously the drop 8%, 10% in week 12, 13. We have to we have to view that in in, um, uh, in combination with the surge in volumes in, in week 11. And it's going to be interesting to see where, where the volumes actually stabilize. I think also if you look at the, uh, the right hand side of the graph there, we can see the Norwegian export to value. So obviously uh, volumes were somewhat lower and, um, and prices were lower, but in value terms, it's still, uh, it's still not terrible, I would say. I'm actually quite surprised of, of uh, how how well the market's actually held up so far. Um, now this is uh, this is quite an interesting slide. So we've been tracking China, South Korea, Italy, which is sort of the, the early hit markets in order to try and engage what's going to happen to the other markets. And to start with, uh, with the absolute volumes in China on the left hand side, we can see that they basically dropped to pretty much zero. And then it's recovered uh, by week 14 to a level which is actually above uh, the pre-corona uh, outbreak and is actually also up on a year-over-year -year basis in percentage terms. South Korea has been fairly flat uh, with a very limited effect from, from um, the corona virus. And then you have Italy, which, uh, which obviously dropped initially about 20% and then we have some weeks uh, with Close to 50% drop, but now it's stabilized. Uh, it's roughly 20% below. Uh, but those export numbers do not tell the whole truth because obviously this is direct export from Norway to Italy. Some of the volumes will go to Poland or Denmark to be processed and then be shipped into the retail segments in Italy from, from those processing countries. So once again, I think probably looking at the EU as a whole uh, might be a better gauge of the underlying demand. But if China has anything to go by, uh, demand should gradually recover uh, over 10 to 14 weeks. Um, another interesting observation is, of course, the lessons from past crises. Uh, you have the financial crisis, um, 2007, 8, and 9, where we actually had increasing sound spot prices. And then you have 2012, where you have this massive supply uh, shock with 24% global supply growth. And uh, at that point, of course, prices dropped. But I think it's it's important to note that uh, the fact that the world might go into a recession does not necessarily mean that salmon prices will follow down. Uh, the argument we've heard historically is, of course, that people don't buy a new car, they don't go on an expensive holiday, they would rather gather friends and family and have a nice meal. Um, so let's see if that's, uh, that's true in this type of crisis as well. But I would say that uh, what we're seeing now kind of looks more like 2012. 
it's obviously not a supply shock, it's a demand shock. Um, but I don't think it's representative of the underlying demand for seed. Which I think is still fairly solid. Um, if we look at the historical EBIT per kilo margin, what we're seeing here is that uh, during 2007-8 and also during 2012 crisis, EBIT per kilo uh, obviously dropped, uh, but it still stayed in, in positive territory. Uh, so they were still making money on the EBIT line. The difference back then was, of course, that the balance sheets were, were much more stretched, uh, much higher leverage uh, per kilo produced. So further down the PL, uh, there were definitely losses. Um, so what have we done to our estimate so far? Well, if you look at the right hand side, you have the sum of price estimates in euros per kilo. Uh, the bottom uh, chart shows the difference versus our previous estimates. So Q2, we have cut our, our target price, uh, sorry, our um, uh, sum of price estimate from 6 euros 40 to 5 euros. Um, so 1 euro 40 down and then 1 euro down in, in Q3. And then from Q4 onwards, uh, between 20 and 40 euro cents lower summer price. Obviously, how deep the price will drop in Q2 is, is almost anyone's guess. This is uh, our, our best case at the moment, our best guess at the moment. Um, and obviously, if you look at the, the price drop in long terms, it's somewhat better because of the weak uh, compared to the euro. I think um, our base case is one thing, but we've also done a bear case uh, with break-even prices for the next four quarters, basically 40 knocks in Q2, 35 in, in Q3, and then 40 in Q4 and Q1. Um, so we're looking at a bear case price, which is well, 12 to 23 knocks per kilo lower than our base case, which was already lowered from our previous estimates. And what we can see if we look at the EBIT per kilo uh, margin, uh, on a quarterly basis is that our bear case would basically uh, represent the, the steepest uh, drop in, in EBIT margin uh, we've ever seen, uh, even worse than 2012, uh, but it, it is expected to, to normalize in, in 2021. Now this is another interesting uh, slide and it, it kind of goes to how the seafood sector and salmon companies are being hit uh, in the stock market by the corona. So the green bars uh, is seafood companies and uh, the red uh, and purple bars are, um, are sort of other sectors. And uh, the bar to, uh, on the right side is the enterprise value, while the bar on the left side is the market cap. And obviously it's very easy to look at the market cap or the share price and say, oh, seafood is down 30 uh, percent. We have several other companies which are down 40, 50 or 60 percent uh, as, as awkward solutions. But obviously uh, the value of a company is made up not only of, um, of, the, uh, of the equity but also on the debt part. So if you look at the total value and the enterprise value, uh, if you look all the way on the right you can see a retailer like, uh, like Orkla which has hardly had any impact. Um, but if we stick to sort of the, the middle names, you have <clears throat> oil companies like Equinor, Norsk Hydro, Aqua Solutions, which is an oil, oil and gas exposed uh, company. Uh, and you see that the, the total enterprise value is down about 24%. That kind of is a bit strange when you look at the uh, Salmar, Greek or Moe or Bakka, high quality companies which basically produce food, which should be significantly more defensive. So I'm a bit surprised that we haven't seen seen. Uh, uh, I'm a bit surprised to see how abruptly uh, a lot of these seafood names have been sold down, given the fact that their balance sheets are so strong. And when you look at the enterprise value, there is very little debt. The vast majority of the uh, enterprise value is made up of equity. Uh, looking at the, the multiples, um, we've obviously had multiple expansion over the last few years. Um, we're seeing a, a quite abrupt uh, correction in, in terms of the multiples, um, but it's not it's not um, it's not down to sort of historical levels um, at the moment. If we look at the names on an absolute sense, um, 
we have upgraded all of our, our um, salmon names to uh, Dubai uh, with material upside for most of them. Uh, I'm looking at the, uh, the multiples at the moment. Uh, we're looking at six and a half times EBITDA, uh, less than 10 times uh, earnings with, uh, with close to 6%. Dividend yields, so so quite uh, quite attractive valuations uh, on absolute uh, sense um, from companies. Which once again, they will emerge on the other side of this uh, this event with the same number of shares as they went into. That's at least my my impression, and I think a lot of investors as well are, are focusing on this at the moment. Um, basically, looking at companies which are solid enough to pull through. Uh, but also where the demand side or, or the, the business will not have changed materially on the, on the other side of this crisis. And uh, yes, of course, the spot price is under pressure at the moment, uh, no doubt about it. But I do believe that, um, let's say, six months from now or 12 months from now, I do believe the underlying demand for salmon, uh, the underlying consumption pattern of, uh, of consumers uh, is probably not changed that And I think I'm gonna gonna leave it at that, given our our tight uh, tight schedule. Well, thank you, Alex. I appreciate that, and I think that gave uh, gave our audience uh, a good sense of what's happening in the salmon farming sector and a good overview of seafood in general. Um, we're going to go ahead and get uh, we're going to go ahead and get moving. As you said, Alex, we have uh, a fantastic lineup and uh, a lot of topics to hit on, and not a whole lot of time. Um, I would say this is probably the most diverse panel that Interfish has ever brought together uh in, in a single event um and that is what makes us so uh so interesting we have executives from the feed aquaculture wild fish processing distribution finance sector um and i'm really really grateful that these people have have, uh, have joined in a time where there's a real vacuum of information because more than ever uh we need to exchange information we need to exchange ideas and strategies um, because I think everyone's looking for solutions, everyone's looking for a pathway through, uh, everyone's looking for a way to pivot their businesses uh, to this new reality. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce our speakers. They will be uh, on webcam. You'll be able to, to see them and, uh, and see their names under, underneath for, for those of you that don't know these speakers. Um, Frank Dulcich is the president and CEO of Pacific Seafood Group and the chairman of the National Fisheries Institute. Jan Tharp is the president and CEO of Bumblebee Seafoods. Carlos Diaz is the CEO of Biomar. Andreas Kwame, the CEO of Greek Seafood. Tim Fires, the president of Supply Track at MPD Group. And Frere Tortison is the senior VP at DNB Bank overseeing North American seafood. Hello, everyone. So, Tim, I'm going to go ahead and start off with, uh, with you. And I'm hoping that you can. Uh, can just sort of lay the groundwork for our audience and let us know where we are. So much has changed in the past month. Uh, so many people have had to adjust their business models away from food service toward retail. Um, and, and, you know, everyone's, everyone's looking for how they can adjust their businesses to meet this new reality. Can you give us just a sense of where we've been in the past uh, few weeks both on food service and retail in the United States and to uh, a certain extent, uh, other markets. If you're like most of the folks I talk to, March feels like it's lasted over a year. So it's kind of hard to kind of think like what happened before March. Um, but I think it's important to kind of hit a couple of themes that were happening before March, because that's really what we're seeing happening in March. So if we look at prior, it's really important to think about food service and retail. So if we think about how consumers consume food, 80% of our food was coming from in-home and 20% was coming from a food source perspective. And that's important because right now what we're seeing in the current trend is that obviously more of that is moving in-home because I have those are the options and I actually have more time to prepare meals. Um, of what was really growing in food service, it was really being grown by check size because we go out for the experiences and the convenience. 
And what we're seeing now is the fact we would expect check sites to come down because more about what's happening is delivery. Um, and typically those check sizes are smaller than what we see when you go into a dine-in restaurant. Um, prior to March, we were seeing you know, quick service and, and um, fast casual really seeing the growth where full service was struggling, but we we're also seeing some value and some growth with independents and micro chains. What we're seeing in March is very much uh, reflective of that. Is first couple of weeks of March look just like the early part of the year. The last three weeks is where we really saw the decline. Started off somewhat gradual, 20% decline in food service uh, that third week in March, and then it really moved to 36 and then 42. Uh, this first week of April, we're actually seeing that we feel like we may have found the bottom. Um, and part of that is because non-commercial isn't changing that much. That's really gonna be about healthcare right now, long-term care. Um, those residents are dining in more. There's more meals being served based on protocol decisions and changes. Uh, but really what's happening for uh, away from home in terms of using restaurants, it's delivery. So we did see the first week in April look better than the last week in March. So our hope is that what consumers have done in March Really, number one, they realized what was happening. Um, they got to the new reality. And so the new reality is that they're bringing food service back into their lives. And if you think about from restaurants, quick service was more available and ready and, and the processes and the menus were there to take advantage of off-premise dining. And then full service really had to pivot. And some of the things that we've mentioned that, you, that all of us are reading about, a lot of that pivot has been about changing uh, whether or not they're offering groceries or not, whether or not they did prior to that or not. Uh, so we are seeing more things like people getting creative about how they're approaching that. But at the end of the day, what we really see is that the consumer was already moving toward off-premise. They were already moving towards using digital technology to order, whether it's takeout or pickup or, uh, or delivery, third-party delivery. The third-party delivery was already really growing um, at a uh, high level, double digit level within food service. And we expect that what you're seeing now is that's gonna continue. Um, what we did see, what was interesting, the operators that did really well were operators that were focused on meals for families, which makes sense because we saw, saw that in China too, back in February with our international business, we saw that there were larger uh, meals because households were together. So we're seeing that in the US as well. So things like pizza, uh, chicken, those operators that had uh, barbecue. So they, if they had things that really fed many, they did better than those that didn't. Um, in this last week, uh, or this first week of April, comparing that back, another trend we saw was cuisines. Uh, ethnic cuisines were really showing growth. Now they're still down, so I don't wanna misrepresent. They're down uh, by around that 40%, but many of those are performing better than the average. And we think that's because consumers really are looking for that type of meal and that experience that they can't create at home. And they're looking in this new reality, they're looking for something that's enjoyable and that they can share with their family. And possibly part of that is, as younger generations are in the household right now with their families, they're bringing new foods into the households so that the overall experience is for everyone. So we are seeing, we, it's too early to say, are we at the bottom? But we believe that based on what we saw between the last week in March and the first week in April, that we've somehow stabilized that this is the new reality and food service is where it's going to be maybe for the next couple of weeks. Um, it's, you know, we're, we're looking week by week now. We can't look to say two months from now what's going to happen because what we think we've got to really pay attention to now is when do we restart? And some of the restart is about regional restarts. So when do certain pockets of the country open up before others? And then what does that mean in terms of restaurants being open for dine-in? Some of the things that we saw in China and some of the things that we're hearing in the US are consumers are ready to return to restaurants. They're looking forward to that. They're looking forward to gathering and having events with their friends and family. So we think that's positive for the opportunity once the economy opens back up and we come out of stay-at-home orders, the opportunity really is there for food service. Uh, right now, in terms of what we're kind of projecting for in-home, it is definitely growing. And we see that probably from a meal perspective, there's just under 100 meals that have moved from food service to in-home on average. 
So Tim, um, thanks for that for that table setting. That's fantastic. And I think what's interesting is this idea of a V-shaped recovery. Um, I'm going to turn this over to to the practical uh, side of things. And and Frank, um, Pacific has a lot of business in food service, um, also uh, exposure in retail. But I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how your operation has needed to pivot over the past month to this new reality of, uh, of food service essentially falling off the map. Nope, and Frank, I think you're, Frank, you're muted there, so. We can't, still can't hear you. There's a little mute button there at the top upper yeah. right. There we go. There we got you now. Okay. Just want to make sure because it's uh, the organizers muting us too. Well, welcome. Yeah, falling off the face of the map. And let's just say it's been an elevator ride down. Um, our sector on the distribution side is probably 45% food service and 65% retail. And um, Tim was talking earlier is that we have seen uh, stabilization on that. Uh, but in some sectors, when the states, uh, the governors have uh, done the shelter in place versus the states that have not done in such an aggressive way, um, in some of those areas, we've seen a 98% sales drop on food service. But in, in inverse of that, if we've seen a 200% increase in retail. But what the sectors are doing now is we're seeing a, really a stabilization of what we see at least as Tim described, the next week. And what I believe that was true a week ago is not true today. And what we've seen is, and it's really lightning, is you always have to take a negative and turn it into a positive. And so what we've been able to pivot on is just see all the things that we've been doing poorly, and that's I'm speaking to everyone, because it really highlights what you know you should have been doing or could have been done. And you're shifting now into ways that you wanted to do things um, and that's what we've really been positively focused on and how our business is going to be looking when we come out of this. Uh, we have really reorganized in the last three weeks a substantial portion of our processing, aquaculture and distribution side of the businesses. And we'll be using a lot more technology of how we process and do orders and taking uh, a number of uh, positions that permanently will be removed in the company and really come back much stronger and more agile business so it's really helped us focus on what do we need to clean up and we needed to clean up some things so what have some of those things been frank i mean one of the things that's been interesting to me is it seems that it hasn't been um that we've seen all these surprising trends uh out of nowhere it, it kind of what you're saying it seems is that we're seeing an acceleration of trends that were already in progress correct and for example on our um on our ordering cycles. We've used some of the old technology as far as you know, calling sales and, and I'm talking distribution now, where now we're gonna have a, a web app just on, on iPhones or smartphones, where we're basically bypassing all sales right into our inventory, basically creating orders on our, and we rank our customers A through F, depends on uh, various things around a customer. And there's gonna be a segment of those customers that we now will be using what we call the Pacific Uber style or a um, uh, that bypasses all cost. We will be able to shed, let's just say multiple millions of dollars out of our distribution channel and our integrated channel by using technology and really connecting our customers directly to our inventories and then to their orders. What's different about that is Amazon's really been helpful in, in really leading that charge. And now with us in uh, for 30 days or longer, being sheltered in place where we're, everybody's beginning to use more and more uh, online services. And we just really, as a company, see we need to pivot right into that, uh, that channel uh, to uh, garner a number of sales, both to B2B as well as B2C. So it's really shotgun those trends. I, I want to bring in uh, Andreas, you, um, Alex talked a little bit about uh, some of the uh, some of the moves that have happened in uh, in in salmon. 
Um, just from a fresh distribution point of view, uh, I'm curious to, to hear from all the panelists. We'll, we'll hit on this a little bit, but given what Frank's talking about, the shortening of the supply chain uh, of, of more maybe frictionless uh, movement of product, how is that impacting fresh? Because obviously there's air cargo challenges, there's uh, uh, cold chain uh, challenges. So how is that impacting kind of the lifeblood of Norwegian farm salmon, which is a uh, fresh product? Well, Norway export uh, salmon to 80, 90 countries uh, around the, the globe. And the challenges is not the same in, uh, in all of the markets. The logistic issue is for sure one of the things that has been a, a challenge uh, in this, uh, this period, especially when it comes to, um, to um, air freight. You are half the way from Norway to Frankfurt or to London or wherever you should fly from, and uh, then the, they cancel the, the airplane. So it has really been a struggle for us to, to really keep up with this. There has been actually all the time quite good demand in a different market in, in Asia. Uh, looking at the China, that was the one that went, went down first, but now it's coming back up again. So we see there is coming more logistic solutions uh, in place, uh, cost more expensive than it was before because now it's more cargo and less belly transport that we are using. Uh, from Greek seafood, we have had the benefit of having um, uh, multiple uh, places that we can take fish from, from British Columbia, from Scotland, from, from uh, Norway. So we can, uh, can route uh, more to the customers, for instance, from British, British Columbia to Asia, when Norway drop out uh, more or less in, in a period. So it has been really challenging and, and more costly, but I feel now that it's more coming in, the panic is less and they're more, it's more constructive what's happening now. And you see more and more solutions uh, coming up. Also solution that Frank was talking about in, in the air freight uh, area. Although I think it will take a bit more time. So I'm curious about product forms. Like I, like I mentioned before, um, it's interesting to see which, which product forms might be benefiting and which might be struggling uh, as part of this. And Jan, I'm going to bring you in here because it would seem to me this is kind of the, the golden age for uh, for canned uh, products, for canned tuna and canned salmon. Um, certainly, I can say from uh, my own shopping that, uh, well, apart from toilet paper, I guess, um, canned seafood seems to be one of the things flying off the shelves. But, you know, um, Andreas just mentioned panic buying. We've seen this spike in retail. Um, what do you think long term about uh, canned shelf stable products and, and how, uh, how the, the uh, life cycle might continue once we're through the worst of this crisis? Let me first check my mic. Yep, you're good. <laughs> okay, that's working good. Um, you're absolutely right. When you look at what's happened over the last month or so, 90% of consumers changed their shopping behavior because of COVID-19. And with that panic buying, we absolutely saw store shelves being depleted of some of the things that are historically pantry fillers and shelf-stable seafood fell into that category. So as the consumers went from, let's stock up on the essentials, then when they would go into the grocery store and see empty shelves, they almost felt this peer pressure to continue to buy products. And now we're moving into what I would call a, a normal state, a shelter at home, but just a little bit more normal. But what we've seen, and I think it's an opportunity clearly for shelf stable seafood is what used to be an emergency pantry filler. You know, our challenge is how do we take that and, and help those consumers realize that what they have really is a high protein affordable product that has so many uses and and i think that's really our challenge going forward if we look at new users into the shelf stable seafood category just in the last six weeks 70 percent of uh, the people purchasing are new users into the category and i think that's a remarkable opportunity if we can reach out to them and show them all the many uses of of shelf-stable seafood. 
that it's not just an emergency pantry filler. It's actually a great tasting product. So, um, Frank, I want to kick it back over to you on that because, um, you know, the the uh, the product forms are quite are quite interesting. So Jan's saying that that canned is is seeing this spike, obviously, and this idea that there's an opportunity for the seafood industry here to reposition things, whether it's it's canned or frozen fresh, uh, you know, ambient products like smoked salmon. So, which products are you are you seeing? that are having the real potential, not just in short-term growth, but um, what do you see that might, looking past the crisis, might benefit from this change that consumers may um, experience a, a different way of consuming seafood? Um, and I'll say it this way, you know, we're focused in the frozen and fresh case, not in the shelf stable as Jan's businesses. What we're seeing is that I think there's gonna be a hard look uh, from our retails, now this is futuristic, that have uh, fresh cases. The cost of staff, the amount of uh, throwaway and waste, and that square footage, I think is gonna get converted in a number of stores, potentially, to more of a uh, grab and go meal kind of kit, uh, eat at home uh, uh, process. And that's what I think everybody should be looking at to pivot to in some sectors uh, in the nation, in the country. So what we're seeing is a real strong pivot in our side of the business growth is on that meal ready uh, components uh, to serve uh, consumers uh, move away from maybe those counters that might not be there in the future. So, so that raises kind of an, an interesting question, Frank, and that is to what extent should businesses be focusing on changing their models? Is there a risk that um, the companies get too reactive uh, and suddenly completely revamp their business models and say, okay, we, we've got to retool, we've got to invest in, in retail, forget food service. How do you balance that risk of saying, okay, we need to change what we do, but it may not need to be uh, permanent or, uh, or, or we may be aware that trends are changing, like you said earlier, literally week to week. It is. And again, when we come out of this, it's going to be a real stat uh, that we see, and at least in our business sectors, is it's not going to be a hockey stick. It's going to be a slow recovery. We see um, when we went into this, at least 20 percent of our food service customers really told us if we're going to be down for three to four weeks, we won't be coming back. And I feel that number in some sectors of the country, especially the states that have gone to a hard shelter in place, I see a number of those restaurants, smaller ones now, that uh, up to 40% of some of our customers won't be returning um, in business. And this is not only because of COVID-19, but it's been in some of the states and um, the, the tip wage, FMLA, um, scheduling, all these other things. Have been, this is kind of the last uh, nail in a number of uh, customers that are in the restaurant business. So by understanding that you're going to lose that sector, um, there's going to be a shift to other areas and people have gotten more comfortable. Maybe the benefit out of all this could be people are learning how to cook at home again. Hmm. Andreas, you, you, um, you mentioned earlier sort of the logistics on, on, uh, on fresh salmon. And Frank was saying that ready meals um, and this reduction in the fresh case could change again, accelerate this trend towards uh, fresh pack, skin pack type grab and go products. Are you seeing that as well? And, and what types of investment uh, is Grieg looking at as a result of this change? Do you see it as, all right, it's time to retool, it's time to focus on uh, MAP and fresh pack products for both for Europe and for, uh, for North America? Yeah, we have already been quite outspoken with our strategy going forward and one of the legs that we want to look into and, uh, and are looking into is to reposition the company from being a pure uh, gutted fish producer and selling it as fresh to co go further down in the value chain. Different ways we are, we are looking into that and, and how to, to do it also with uh, our partners in, in the marketplace. But I 100% agree. I think uh, it's only bears that eat the whole salmon. And uh, the good, one of the positive thing 
we find with this is actually what we saw in uh, the financial crisis. We saw it when the supply uh, side became too high. It was actually that we bring in more consumer and new consumer into the, the fish business. They want to have good meals. They learn how to cook more. And we expanded the, mar uh, the market quite uh, significant. And, and that was actually, I think, one of the reasons what happened afterward, that you limit more the, uh, the supply. And uh, the demand was so high that uh, the prices became uh, very high. So I'm going to shift over to sort of the backbone of, uh, we obviously have the harvesting fleet, but on the other side we have uh, we have aquaculture, we have the feed supply chain. So Carlos Diaz from uh, Biomar, um, Carlos, how has uh, coronavirus impacted the feed sector? Um, what has it changed in terms of uh, logistics and, and what has your company had to do to meet uh, some of the needs of, uh, of the, your, uh, your customers? Yeah, can you hear me, Drew? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, it's very different in different parts of the world. We were very early affected. Uh, as you know, we are in China. We uh, were in the middle of opening our second plant there. So uh, it started quite early for us. Uh, January, we were already very hit in that country. Uh, and it's surprising to see how fast it has come back. Uh, so that gives us a hope uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, in general, I would say there are different specific sectors and countries. Uh, but in general, I think the logistics sector, we have been able to, to handle it. Uh, in terms of raw materials, we have not seen very big difficulties, uh, except for the fluctuations and volatility in prices. Uh, you can imagine the commodities, uh, how difficult they are in these uh, days. Uh, then the fishing sector, uh, it has been a, a question in some of the important markets. Is it going to be part of the critical supply chain or not? So that creates also uncertainty in the raw materials. So I think uncertainty is the biggest uh, challenge in the raw materials. Logistics, we have been able to handle it, uh, I would say, quite okay in most of the countries. So from that part, from the supply point of view, it has been okay, I would say. Uh, what can we expect, uh, so, sorry, Carlos, just, just to, to shift a little bit, what can we expect then from those supply chain issues? Would that result in uh, upward pressure on feed prices? Uh, it depends. We have, uh, of course, you have the fishing part of the, the fish part of the diet, which uh, is uncertainty and uh, it could increase, especially the fish oil. But on the other side, you have also the vegetal part of it, which uh, it will depend on how the positions uh, that the, the different uh, markets take on it. Uh, I would expect that it will trend to normalize. That's my, my view right now. But, uh, at the beginning, it has, of course, trend to, to increase in the second quarter. Again, depends on the different markets. We have markets where we take positions six months before, three months before, depending on which part of the world it is. Uh, so I would say, hopefully, uh, things will trend uh, back to normal in the, in the vegetal part, which is a big part of the, of the raw material right now. Uh, so difficult to say now, but I would expect uh, some normalization in the, in the coming months. So you mentioned, you know, some of the investment plans that you had and, and uh, you know, the fact that those might be put on, on hold. And I'm interested, too, in sort of high CapEx uh, projects, R&D. Um, Biomar has been kind of on the forefront with uh, experimental uh, feeds, alternative ingredients, partnering with uh, algae producers and things like that um, to test out uh, different kinds of feed for performance on, on, uh, on salmon and other species. In a climate like this, does R&D take a back seat and do those kind of partnerships just sort of um, get put on the, the back burner and things just get down to straight operational core business? At least in our case, no. Uh, we see definitely R&D in, in the long term and we definitely see that this crisis will go over. Uh, the same with sustainability and a lot of our partnerships are looking for sustainable products. Uh, we see traceability because of what the others have talked about becoming really, really important. So we, since we are 50% of the supplies to the farmers, salmon or trim or whatever, 
we really need to focus on that. I think more and more, if this goes into the online business, or the ready to cook, ready to, to eat meals, uh, the consumer will focus much more on sustainability, in traceability, uh, and therefore we really need to continue with that. Uh, at least until now, we have not cut any programs uh, that we have in R&D or sustainability, neither any investments in new ventures. We are in the middle of opening a factory in Australia, one in China, uh, some lines all over, and basically it's not the time to stop uh, those investments. We, we believe this will come back. Uh, and so far, I, I say, the supplies all over the world has not decreased significantly. Uh, I think we have seen some delays. We have seen uh, people keeping more the fish into the water, maybe changing some of the our diets, but we have not seen a big disruption uh, in the feeding of uh, fish or shrimp. So, Jan, I'm going to go back to you because Carlos mentioned uh, some of the challenges in the wild fish supply chain. Um, and uh, obviously, that's, uh, that's bumblebee spread and butter, um, be it tuna or on the, on the wild salmon side of things. So, what is, uh, what is uh, on the supply side, what are you hearing on keeping those products flowing um obviously a, a lot of uh, different protocols are coming into place for vessels for cruise safety uh logistics challenges with ocean freight so how is bumblebee handling those on the on the tuna and salmon side am i back you're back all right um yeah great question for our for ice our business, obviously, tuna is a, a huge part of our overall portfolio. Uh, we have been able to keep up with demand. Uh, I think Alexander said it in the beginning. What we're dealing with right now is a demand shock. It's more of a, a short-term issue. We need to figure out how long that's going to last. But when you look at our supply chain, it's actually relatively long. So from the standpoint of being able to keep our customers in supply, we have been able to do that. Uh, on some cases, we've had to allocate. Again, when you see demand shocks as significant as we've seen over the last six weeks, certain categories are more stressed than others. But to date, with some changes that we've made inside our facility and working with our customers, we've been able to keep them in supply. So what have some of those changes been just in terms of your production? I mean, what have you had to alter? Um, Carlos mentioned sustainability, mentioned traceability. I know Bumblebee's been, been active on embracing blockchain and embracing MSC. Um, what changes have happened just in the, in the practical um, supply chain that have been, uh, uh, that have been uh, important to make over the past few weeks? Yeah, I, I think uh, one of the things we say a lot here is we have to wear two sets of glasses. So one to read up close and, and one to see far away. And so if you break that down into the two areas, up close is the, the crisis that we're dealing with today. The, the far away is things like sustainability, social compliance, blockchain, none of that is changing. We're just dealing right now with the crisis at hand. And so when you look at the fact that we were hit with so many orders in such a short period of time, I think it was mentioned earlier by, by Tim or Frank, we had to basically take our SKUs and shrink that SKU list down and run product through the facility that was to get us more productivity so that we could keep as many of our customers uh, in an equitable way stocked with canned seafood. So we have reduced our, our SKU count in order to help out with some of the DCs, which is a, another bottleneck with everybody shipping product into the three PLs. We've switched to try to get our customers to do more of a direct plant ship uh, to sit, take that product right out of the DCs. So inside the facility, we've we've done quite a bit to help expedite the orders. Our IT department has been fantastic in developing new reports so we can communicate directly with our customers on a real-time basis as to where their orders are. And, and really it's just it's heightened communication um, with our customers, with our suppliers, and with our employees. So um, Frank, has that been part of the strategy that Pacific has taken as Jan's talking the reduction of SKUs? Um, We've seen that with fresh fish counters as well. If they haven't closed, 
um, in, in Europe uh, and in the US as well, they've kind of said, all right, we need to focus on some cores. We need to bring it back to some, some basics that we can count on with supply, uh, that we know we can get to the consumers that the consumers have proven that they will go for. Have you made that shift as well in terms of reducing SKUs? And are there any products that are kind of, um, you know, winning for a lack of a better word, uh, any species that are winning? Uh, I think Jan's right on point, you know, because you have to rationalize your SKUs to look at in a hierarchy of what really delivers profitability and what costs you more than it is that you're receiving um, at the end of the day. And, and that's part of the whole customer rationalization. You've got to do really both. And that's what we're doing. As far as what's winning out there, it today is really more the heavy core items that are the, like we call them the category killers, the ones that are really like farm salmon, for example. Uh, they want those in the case, especially on limited uh, skew rat rationalization that's occurring right now in the retail because of staffing challenges uh, with COVID-19. Um, but what I see long term is there'll be great niches. Again, we don't have to sell billions of pounds. We have to sell, it depends on what part of the country you're in, you know, that's still that family, local, fresh. It's still the mantra that's still out there and we'll probably and we'll remain at what we see uh people really want to buy from something they someone they trust and a product they trust uh, so i think there's going to be a lot of opportunities come out but you're going to have to look at your own sectors it's not going to be one size can fit all maybe a farm salmon that's uh can broadcast over the country but in the niches that we have throughout the country the benefit is what works in your area to make things happen and what species can differentiate yourself um, is kind of the what I would be looking at for everybody that's on this uh, webinar. So one of the things that, uh, that that we haven't talked about too much, or Frank, you hit on it a little bit with with uh, with your customers, but Frere, I'm going to bring you in because um, you know consolidation will be a, a, a necessary impact here. Uh, there are going to be seafood companies that do not make it. Um, and again, I, I think, as I mentioned to Frank, it seems, and, and as we've talked, as all the panelists have hit on, it's not as if the trends are these crazy new things out of left field. It's almost that it has accelerated trends that were already happening. Um, so, so Frere, um, what what does M&A look like in a time like this when when uh, companies are, are looking for um, for opportunities to grow or uh, you know shift where where their uh, where their focus might be. Is M and A just something that's off people's radar? And uh, what do you expect we'll see in terms of consolidation, uh, both in, in Europe and North America, as a result of this? Right. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Very good. Um, no, I think if we uh, sort of use chance classes, um, short uh, term or short set and, and, and looking ahead, I think, uh, you know, in the short term, um, most companies are probably conserving cash and liquidity. Uh, they are sort of looking uh, to make sure their liquidity is available and they have ample liquidity to deal with the current uh, crisis. Uh, I'm not entirely sure we will see a lot of uh, M&A in the sort of short to medium term, but it is quite likely to uh, pick up again uh, once we see uh, the end of this. Um, the industry in general is headed towards more consolidation and we would see that uh, take, picking up uh, by the end of the year even. So it's not something then necessarily that, that companies should sort of push completely off their radar. Um, then you're saying that there will be opportunities here as well to um, to continue to um, to grow business from a, from an M&A perspective, from an external perspective. Absolutely, I would say so. I mean, there will be you know there will be some follow-ups in the in the process here. Uh, there will be stronger companies that will be able to uh, capitalize on this. Uh, you know, funding and uh, liquidity will be coming back to the market, uh, not uh, so distant the future. Um, so I think. Uh, you know, M&A will pick up and there will be opportunities in not too far, for far distance, I would say. Great. So uh, we are coming to the end of the webinar. It's gone by so fast because we have so many topics to hit on and, and we do hope to do uh, something like this again, because again, I think uh, communication, bringing together 
um, experts like the panelists that we brought in to, to give the industry ideas, to give the industry things to, to think about um, as, they, as they navigate this. Uh, we have gotten uh, some questions, but we're very short on time. So I'm going to ask my colleague, John Fiorillo, uh, if there's uh, questions out there that, um, that we need to, uh, uh, to ask the, the panel that are, are really going to resonate and help us bring to a close here. Uh, no, not yet, John. You need to unmute. How's that? There we go. Okay. Um, there, a really good question just came in about the recent closure of the uh, Smithfield Pork Processing uh, Plant in South Dakota. And that raises questions about what the seafood industry is doing to protect uh, its workers in these plants. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about that in the last week in particular. So maybe I can just throw it out to the panelists to give us some idea of, you know, the current protections, but what also might be happening in the future as far as how these plants will change um, to protect workers. Yeah, you know what? I, I know Frank that you that you need to uh, to run. You have a little bit of a hard stop here, but hopefully you're still with us. And can you hit on this a bit and just um, tell us about that? We've seen, as John mentioned, JBS, Smithfield, uh, Purdue, several other companies that have had COVID spread. They've had to actually shut things down in those plants. Uh, the manufacturing's just completely stopped. Um, so that's one risk. And of course, there's a very risk to human health. Um, how should companies navigate this and what changes do they need to make? Um, there's a lot of different elements to this with staff health and, and safety. So what have you done and what do you think the industry at large needs to be thinking about doing differently? Well, most of our facilities and, you know, have been designed for production and volume through our facilities with close quarters uh, to maximize throughput or pounds per hour, pounds per minute. So when you look at something that's happening and what we're doing today, I mean, so we have facilities that have been designed to do one thing. So rethinking what we need to do, what we've done is platooned uh, and shifted uh, social distancing. We're hydrogen peroxiding, misting our facilities. Um, if we have an issue, uh, we address it quickly. But if, what we've done is we've gone to 50% uh, staffing uh, and shifted swing and uh, day shifts. So we've taken a plant that could produce something in eight hours and spread it uh, half shifts over 16 as an example to give that social distancing um, and provide, you know, uh, in my office, uh, we all have to wear these when somebody comes in, uh, face masks and just have done everything that CDC has requested. And we've gone a little bit further than that to make sure our team members are uh, protected and feel comfortable uh, coming to work. So, Frank, while we have you, I mean, if you're looking, you know, beyond the immediate crisis, um, just just tell us kind of in summation for you, and I'll go around and ask all the panelists this as we as we start to wrap up. But what do you think? What key trend uh, in terms of production or consumption, your choice, um, is going to be something that will stick with us on the other on the other side of this? And then just give you know just a quick long term view. I think on on you know the seafood sector itself. Do you feel that? This is something, is this a bump in the road on that growth trajectory the industry's been on? Or is this a, is this a real, uh, is this gonna cause a real downturn? Well, I'll stay with uh, consumption first and then um, tell you what I see in the future as a downturn. Really the consumption, everybody, we sell the healthiest protein on the planet. And as long as we stay positioned and really know that this is what we're doing, we're providing a great resource sustainable, healthy, and feeding. How do you now take that mantra and shift it into your business to make you improve your business and uh, that messaging to our customers? NFIs, I'm, we're focused on that now in NFI to really, they've done a great job and we're just gonna accelerate that on a national level. As far as the future, um, I think there's gonna be winners and losers. 
and there always is in a situation like this and you need to come out of the fog as fast as you can you need to have your team pivot in looking at what ifs not as far as um, we focus on really adjusting some and possibly the C and D players you might have in your company that because of the shortage of uh, team members that you've been able to hire in the past you know several years I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities to upgrade teams there's going to be a lot of opportunities to um, shift your practices get some outside thinking uh, into your companies I think it's a, it's a great time you know because every even through 2001 and the financial crisis this is definitely um, all those on steroids because it's an it's a it's an international shutdown of uh, commerce which has uh, never been seen at least in uh, my career so I, I'm excited um, and you have to be as a leader, you have to be excited about the opportunities that, you know, your team and you, um, you know, possess. And I, the good news I've told our group is the good news is we're all in the same boat. There's not one business in the seafood industry that hasn't been impacted substantially by this change. Now we're going to be tested how good we are when we come out of this. So let's focus on the positive find that silver lining and let's go for it. So Andreas, uh, over to you then, what are the, uh, what are the, 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 the trends or the single trend that's gonna stick with us and, and what are those opportunities on the other side of this? No, uh, as I said earlier, I think uh, this uh, situation is not uh, only negative for, uh, for seafood because I think that you, you bring more consumer in, in to eat healthy, make good meals, the retail sector is uh, is really boosting this now and, and growing. I think the opportunities is in uh, the internet uh, and ordering and uh, and uh, what's happening there. Uh, more ready meals uh, for sure that will be uh, be and home deliveries. Uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, be permanent for a bit longer period. Period we'll see a significant lower demand from uh, the horeca sector. Uh, because I think uh, coming out of this, people will have another habit that we had before we went into this uh, Corona crisis. Uh, <clears throat> but that said, I'm uh, I'm really optimistic on behalf of the seafood uh, industry. I think that we will strengthen our position and come out in in a much stronger position after this. There will be, as uh, Frank was saying, also there will be, of course, some consolidation and uh, going on, and there will be also some. Unfortunately, some some that will not su survive this, but uh, in the end, there will come out some really bigger and stronger companies. Great. So, uh, Carlos, over to you on that um, single trend that may uh, sort of persist, and and what you see as the opportunities on the other side of this. Yeah, I think basically the same. I, I really believe this is a a bump in the road, a, a big bump, but uh, but I really believe in seafood and and the seafood sector as a healthy, sustainable product. Uh, I believe that the online business will be more and more important. Therefore, traceability, sustainability. Uh, in our case, the, some of the services will be more digital. Uh, and I think in the different uh, species and parts of the world, uh, this is a great opportunity also to work more with the communities. Uh, some of these farming uh, operations and industries are really linked to communities where we have been working with them for a long time, uh, now it's time to, to show that we are really there uh, when they need it. Uh, so I think after this crisis, uh, basically we will be more strong uh, in, in many of the countries. Uh, I'm more concerned on the non-salmon species uh, about the speed of recovery uh, of the Eureka sector. The Mediterranean, for example, some of the species in China or some of the freshwater species. But uh, definitely, the speed of change will, will make the difference. Uh, who is able to shift in the patterns of consumption? Great. Um, Jan, over to you with that same, that same question. Yeah, thanks. I think that everybody on this call, the ultimate goal is to increase seafood consumption. That's a win regardless of what part of the seafood sector you're in. And what we're experiencing right now is change. And I think that change can also be an opportunity. If you look at it the right way, it can certainly be an opportunity. And 
as I look at where do I see those opportunities, uh, I think it's in automation and technology. And when you think about technology and automation, ultimately we need to protect our workers. Uh, this, this virus is going to be an ongoing threat until there's an effective vaccine. It is our job as leaders in this industry to reduce that threat. So how do we do that? We can do that through technology. We can do that through automation. And those same, uh, those same things can also help us on our business. You've heard today about e-commerce taking off uh, different sectors that are going to be more pronounced in the future than are perhaps today. Again, automation and technology, I think, are the two things that I would look at that will help us steer through to the other side of this. Great, great. Uh, Tim, uh, maybe you can give us that, that view as well uh, from the uh, consumer side of things. Um, as you mentioned before, Asia's opening up. Maybe there's some promising sides, some guidance there on what might happen in, in the West. But what do you see as the, the trend that sticks with us and what the opportunities are? Absolutely. Um, I agree with what Frank was saying earlier about uh, recovery will be regional. We saw the losses happen regionally as states issued state order, stay at home. Um, so we expect that there's going to be definitely regional uh, pockets where the growth happens first. Uh, there will do, definitely be fewer players as restaurants are trying to emerge and, and create a new space for themselves or for the players that did not have the financial stability to stay in business and were already on the edge. This could definitely push them over the edge, but it's been a very creative time. And some of the things that I'm hopeful of, um, we have seen from our small appliance business that some of the appliances that are really growing in sales, Instant Pot, which has been hot for a couple of years, uh, air fryers, uh, but even bread making. So this return to home and this ability to kind of, you've got more time now. Uh, some of those things may continue. Uh, we're also seeing hair clippers go up. I don't think that trend's going to continue, but um, <laughs> I've got an immediate need. Uh, but outside of that, in terms of retail, one of the things I love the most that's happened is seeing this connection between uh, retail and local chefs to bring chef-inspired meals into retail so that consumers can take advantage of that. And that really reminded me of what Target has done so well at those pop-up stores. So I'm really hopeful that from a retail perspective, there's a lot more engagement with local chefs uh, for meal kits or whatever that meal may be because uh, local retailers have been able to take advantage of the meal kit opportunity and consumers need that because it comes down to convenience and experience. And then from a restaurant perspective, the things that we're really watching, um, delivery. I mean, this is really going to scale up delivery. The one thing I've, I've been grateful to see that local municipalities have really changed to some of the laws that restricted alcohol sales with those delivery. I'm hopeful that those continue so that the restaurants that are doing delivery have an ability to raise that check price because beverage and desserts are two areas that often get overlooked when you're doing delivery. And then for seafood in general, I agree with uh, panel members. You guys, this industry has such an amazing ability to deliver on what consumers are looking for in terms of health and protein um, uh, experiences, new foods, those things are not going to change. So the ability to be able to deliver on that, whether it be in home or in restaurants, it's going to be really important. I think the one area to really kind of focus on is how do we fix delivery for seafood? Because oftentimes restaurants are afraid to menu those items uh, because they don't deliver well or their experiences that they're afraid that they don't deliver well. I think if we take that opportunity and do something with it, it's a great opportunity for, for seafood. Frere, I'm gonna uh, give you, you have one minute because we're already going quite a bit over, but if you were to say the one area that seafood companies should be investing in, what would that be? Oh, okay. Uh, the one area, I, I think, uh, you know, we're quite excited about automation, process automation and packaging in general. I think that's a, a great area to invest in. And we have been quite focused as a bank on digitalization in the industry. We feel the industry has uh, not, uh, has, has been lacking a bit compared to other industries. So I think digitalization is an interesting aspect, uh, is an important uh, aspect of the business to invest in. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, we're all getting used to new technology, all getting used to new ways of communicating. So thanks for bearing with us. And uh, thanks for the panelists for learning all this technology 
uh, very quickly over the past uh, over the past week with our events team. Uh, this has been recorded. It will be available on intrafish.com. I know we we have a max of, of 500 attendees and completely maxed out. And uh, if some of your colleagues weren't able to get in, um, our apologies. Uh, but a lot of people are are looking for information and looking for ideas. And I just want to extend one more thank you to the panelists. This is a time of uh, of complete change of a lot of unknowns and uh, and for you to all join us and give your thoughts uh, in a time when uh, when there is so many things that uh, that that are unknown I really appreciate that 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 takes uh, that takes a lot of gumption to come out and uh, and, uh, and and be grilled by by intrafish so thank you all again uh, we hope to do this uh, soon again. Uh, we feel like more than ever, uh, we have a responsibility to Intrafish as an information provider, uh, as a, an independent uh, journalism outfit to, um, to try to drive the conversation forward. So please reach out to us if there's areas you think we need to be covering, if there's uh, things you think we can do to help, uh, to help uh, add more um, to the discussion and, uh, and give folks a little bit more guidance about where to, uh, where to go in navigating this difficult time. So thank you all so much uh, and we'll look forward to uh, seeing you at an Interfish Digital event again in the future. Thank you.